It gives me great pleasure to produce Dr. Martha Grogan, visiting from the Mayo Clinic, where she's a consultant in the Department of Cardiovascular Diseases and director of the Cardiac Amyloid Clinic. Dr. Grogan's a native of Cincinnati, Ohio, and received a Bachelor's of Science in, in Biology in the University of Cincinnati. She graduated from Northwestern University Medical School and then completed internal medicine residency at, at Mayo Clinic, and then followed by a three-year uh, National Health Service Corps commitment at the Federal Medical Center, where she was at the, which was the U.S. Bureau of Prisons Tertiary Care, where she was the Chief of Internal Medicine and Medical Director, Associate Warden and completed cardiovascular fellowship with subspecialty training in adult congenital heart disease at the Mayo Clinic. After briefly leaving, she was attracted back to Mayo again and, and uh, returned as a, a cardiology consultant and then joined the Mayo Clinical staff in 1998. Her career has uh, been focused on echocardiography, adult congenital heart disease, and uh, now especially cardiac amyloidosis, where she's really one of the world's leading experts in the field of cardiac amyloidosis, and that's what she'll be speaking about today. Um, she founded the Cardiac Amyloid Clinic at, at Mayo in 2012, and she's uh, really led an incredible clinical trial team up there for cardiac amyloidosis, and her research has been really at the forefront of the field um, with uh, really high-impact uh, publications, uh, especially in the last few years with the recent uh, drug trials for, amylo for TTR amyloidosis. So it gives me a tremendous pleasure to have uh, such a world-renowned speaker and, and wonderful person here to, to, to speak to us and educate us about cardiac amyloid. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Barry. It's really my honor to be here. Um, um, Mawash Cassie worked with us. We had a great time with her in Rochester. She didn't like the weather too well. So um, it's great to come. And, and, uh, and also, I'm really looking forward to seeing your facility. So it is, I think, a brave new world. There's so much going on in uh, cardiac amyloidosis, and I hope to convince you that uh, it's really not a rare uh, disease. Um, here are my uh, disclosures, and we'll talk a little bit about some off-label uh, use. So I'm going to start right out with just looking at these echoes. Um, which patient uh, do you think has uh, amyloidosis? And I'll let you just kind of look at those, and we'll come back to them uh, later. And then we'll, we'll move into uh, a, a case, this first patient, 57-year-old who presented with some palpitations while he was running. He wasn't real worried about it, but it was different than before. He had been off of his exercise routine for a little while. He thought he might be deconditioned. He had a regular treadmill exercise test. Some non-sustained ventricular tachycardia was noted. Um, and he was kind of reassured that nothing too bad was found. Six months later, he, he got an echocardiogram, and that showed thick walls. He was diagnosed with non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, started on a beta blocker, and it was recommended that family screening uh, be performed and that he have genetic testing. Nine months into this, a new cardiologist came to town and looked at his echo and said, gosh, I think you might have cardiac amyloid. Um, so now, now that you suspect that this gentleman, based on imaging, uh, might have cardiac amyloid, I'll just ask you to, you don't have to raise your hand, but maybe just think about it. How many people want to do a serum protein electrophoresis, serum-free light chains? I see a lot of votes for that. Beta-2 microglobulin, 5-HIAA, or I have no idea. Okay, so a lot of times when I ask this, people will pick serum protein electrophoresis. And that's the one that I really want to drill into your head is the wrong answer. So the answer, according to the way this is, is worded, uh, is the serum-free light chain. So when we're screening for AL amyloid, and even though AL amyloid is still a rare disease, it's probably underdiagnosed. We're going to talk a lot about TTR amyloid. But to really diagnose TTR, you have to know about AL. So you can't say, I only want to know about one kind and not the other. You need to know about both. But when we're screening for AL amyloid, we need to do serum and urine electrophoresis with immunofixation, not just the serum protein electrophoresis alone. And I just learned recently that in some labs, it's set up as a reflex, SPEP first, if abnormal, immunofixation. I was, and uh, Maury Gertz was with me, and he said, no, 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 that's orders of magnitude wrong that you're going to miss. So you really need to order that serum uh, uh, immunofixation. And you should do urine. You can do a spot urine, 
Uh, it's not that big a deal. Serum-free light chains. And then also to remember, we're going to talk about now we can diagnose TTR amyloid in certain situations without tissue. But that goes against everything that we um, thought for years. But for AL amyloid, you always have to have tissue from somewhere, not necessarily the heart, that shows amyloid. And then you really should have mass spectrometry tissue typing because that's the most accurate way uh, to know which type of amyloid you have. And as we'll see when we talk about the treatment, the treatment is vastly different. So we have to get it right from the beginning. Which type of amyloid do we have? So what happened with him? Well, I told you that it was at nine months that the new cardiologist said, maybe you have amyloid. And he, he recommended an MRI, but it didn't get done for until 11 months. It was read as kind of poor quality, indeterminate. Anybody know why that might be? Because they couldn't null the myocardium. So uh, that really was a sign of amyloidosis, but that was not recognized. 13 months into this, he goes to see a urologist to follow up on his kidney stones, and the urologist does a urinalysis and said, you've got proteinuria. You better go see somebody about that. So eventually, 15 months after he first presented with uh, cardiac symptoms, he got a free light chain uh, uh, abnormal, uh, assay that was abnormal, and then 17 months, he eventually got the diagnosis of AL amyloid. So I just show you that this is a long, long clinical course, too long. Uh, uh, certainly in this day and age, and the free light chain would have gotten the diagnosis or gotten him onto the diagnosis quite, quite early. So it wasn't dramatic, but still he had a significantly abnormal uh, lambda uh, free light chain and an abnormal ratio. Um, his trepona was 0.08, NT pro BNP in the beginning was about 2,000, creatinine 1.4. And he did have significant proteinuria uh, over uh, four grams of protein. So we'll just review, um, because I know we have a spectrum of, uh, of uh, um, individuals as far as uh, knowledge about amyloid, some very, very detailed and some that probably don't see it as much. But there are two main types of amyloid that affect the heart. And that's good for us because there's, there are over 30 different proteins that can form amyloid, but for cardiologists, we really only pretty much need to know about two. So we have AL, where um, the problem is uh, a plasma cell dyscrasia in the bone marrow, making excess immunoglobulin, and that protein becomes unstable and misfolds and forms amyloid. And the TTR, transthyretin type amyloid, um, the protein is made in the liver and then becomes unstable after it's uh, formed. So it's completely different, and in this case, there's no actual pathology uh, in the liver. Of the transthyretin type amyloid, there's two types. The hereditary or familial type of uh, amyloid, patients inherit a mutation, and their transthyretin protein is more prone to misfolding. That one's pretty easy to understand. But the harder one, in a way, where basic scientists are trying to figure out why it happens, are these wild-type patients. So wild-type transthyretin amyloidosis, there is no mutation in the, in the protein. The protein appears to be uh, structurally normal, but for whatever combination of reasons, whether it's aging factors, chaperone proteins, if you learn about protein misfolding, it's very uh, complex, something makes their protein uh, unstable. And that's the one that we used to call um, senile cardiac amyloidosis. However, our youngest patient at Mayo Clinic was 47 when he was diagnosed. So looking around this room, I don't think anybody's going to apply the term senile to somebody that's 47. And actually, that patient got a heart transplant within a year of his diagnosis. Another little thing about the senile is when you start seeing a lot of amyloid patients, um, many of them have been very healthy before they get the diagnosis. They've often been very physically active. They've been doing everything that we preach for a healthy lifestyle. So it's, it's a huge shock to them. Then they go on the internet, and if they're a TTR amyloid, they start reading about AL, or even sometimes some doctors tell them, you're going to die within six months. I just had a patient like that. Well, TTR amyloid is more slowly progressive. They have a better overall prognosis, even though it's a serious disease. But when you're sitting with them, there's all this angst, and they're all worried about the amyloidosis. One little thing you can do is you say, well, you say to these patients, they're almost all men. They're usually over the age of 60. You say, well, no, 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 you're not the senile type. You're the wild type. And they absolutely love that. You can finally get them you know, to smile a little bit when you tell them that they're the wild type. That just makes them feel a little bit better. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail of what happens in the two types of amyloid. So in AL amyloidosis, again, as I mentioned, the bone marrow 
has an excess of plasma cells, they're all the same clone making excess immunoglobulin. And this is what uh, you'll see where the heavy chain and light chains dissociate. And these light chains that are floating around, that's what we can measure now. And when we didn't have that assay, it was more difficult, but that's really uh, made it much easier. And then those things glom together form amyloid fibrils that get into the heart. Now with transthyretin, you see that the transthyretin um, protein is made in the liver. It's a tetramer, so it should stay together uh, as this uh, uh, tetramer uh, and circulates throughout the blood. But for patients with amyloidosis, it's breaking apart. Then you have these subunits of TTR, same as what happens with the AL amyloid, only this video actually shows you that then this gunk um, gloms together to form amyloid. And amyloid is really just the substance that then gets deposited in the organs and tissues of the heart. So now here you see uh, the myocardium. So the amyloid uh, is extracellular, and then you can also have toxicity from the light chains themselves or from the subunit of the uh, uh, TTR. So what are the, we talked a little bit about the different types of amyloid, and what are some of the clinical features that we see? AL amyloidosis, which historically, probably, even though it's more rare, most of us had more familiarity with it, um, can present with multi-organ failure. That's very common, but some patients do have uh, almost isolated cardiac involvement. So they have heart failure, and clues to the diagnosis may be hepatomegaly, peripheral or autonomic neuropathy, nephrotic syndrome. They could have pulmonary involvement. You'll read in the textbooks about macroglossia and periorbital purpura, and that's fine if you see that, that but that's rare. But a simple thing, if you have a patient that you're suspecting amyloid and you just look at their tongue, if they really have macroglossia with dental impressions, I mean, you pretty much are, you know, 99.9% .9 sure you know you have AL amyloid. So it's a simple physical exam finding that we don't want to forget. Now, of the transthyretin type amyloid, the hereditary patients can present either with heart failure or peripheral neuropathy or an overlap of the two. And it's important to recognize that the hereditary patients, uh, over half of them do not have a, an established family history. So you can't count on the family history to help you with these hereditary patients. Also very important that although we do say this is one of the most rare types of amyloid, 4% um, of black Americans, individuals that are of African or Caribbean descent actually, carry the V122I mutation. So that's a lot of people at risk. They don't all get amyloidosis, but that's a lot of potential patients. So it, that is another subset where, where we start looking at it, uh, uh, we will find more patients. Now with the wild type that I just told you about, what we used to call senile uh, amyloid, they generally, up until now, we've been diagnosing most of them when they've progressed to heart failure. But earlier in their clinical history, you will see that a high proportion of them have had bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. Usually they've had that eight to 10 years before any signs of any cardiac involvement. They may have biceps tendon rupture. They might not even be aware of it, but they have Popeye sign. We're increasingly finding out that they often have a history of spinal stenosis. Now, that's a common condition. Not everybody has amyloid, but that's a, a, another uh, feature, a little trigger in your mind. Uh, they also, really important for our electrophysiologists to start looking for this because they often come in with atrial arrhythmias and or conduction system disease. So patients that come needing, uh, they come have several ablations often before they ever uh, uh, start to get heart failure, or they might come in and get a pacemaker. And if you look back, a lot of times the walls were thick on the echocardiogram, but the patient looked really good and nobody ever thought that they might have uh, amyloidosis. So back to the AL amyloid, it really is a race against time. So I showed you that patient where it took 17 months for him to get the diagnosis, and that is just too long. So it really should be considered to be a medical emergency. Over 20% of the patients still die within the first six months. Uh, once you suspect amyloid, really you should consider it AL until you've proven otherwise. And you can't be guessing. You can have some idea, but you can't guess at the amyloid. You really have to know. So this is a rule that I, I just made up, not based in uh, too much fact, but I think once you think a patient might have cardiac amyloidosis, you should give yourself one week to get to the answer of, is there amyloid or not? 
Now, you won't have all the typing and everything else, but you can have the majority uh, of what you need. And some of the AL patients, we won't, if it's so obvious that everything points to AL, we will start chemotherapy right away, even while we're waiting for the mass spectrometry. So it, the, the, the early drop-off is really a concern. And as cardiologists, we can do things fast. I mean, look how fast we can diagnose a STEMI, how, you know, what, what we do with cardiogenic shock. So why are we spending all the time that I just showed you with that patient to take 17 months to get to a diagnosis. So it's going to take you a little longer to, you know, uh, after you get past that first week, but you'll be off to a great start. So back to him, um, I showed you that, you know, his biomarkers were, were elevated, but in a pretty, you know, not too severe range when he was first diagnosed. Um, he started chemotherapy with uh, Cybor-D and had a complete hematologic response. He did have stem cells harvested in anticipation of possible uh, 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 of um, possible stem cell, but he got into trouble even uh, um, when he was having that stem cell harvesting, which is kind of a little stress test. And I didn't tell you here that one reason that we held off on stem cells after he got the initial chemotherapy then is he, he de definitely developed heart failure probably a combination of both the progression of the natural history of the disease that had now been percolating along with him, and then the steroid effect and the effect of the chemotherapy. So his nt pro -BNP went, uh, I think, almost about 6,000. Um, he had dyspnea and edema, but, you know, after his treatment, uh, he was working full-time. Uh, he clinically improved, and, and actually nt pro -BNP almost 8,000 after his first two cycles. So um, his urine protein is uh, uh, still uh, high and creatinine is up. So now he's actually just recently made the one-year mark, and he is getting better. But the point about him is it would have been much better if we had diagnosed him and treated him earlier. So uh, uh, that's the key. And why is that so important? Because this is showing us if we look at overall um, survival of patients who are not candidates for stem cells. So those are the sicker patients with more multi-organ involvement and often with cardiac involvement. And and they're the ones that often, as cardiologists, we are seeing now. If you look at this, this has improved over time. The survival had been only about 25% at two years uh, back in the early 2000s. And it's getting better. It's getting closer to 50%. But you notice a steep uh, drop off early in the clinical course. And that's where patients are dying of sudden death and or heart failure. So we as cardiologists need to make the diagnosis faster. And that would have been helpful in this patient. But look at if you can get a patient to stem cell, which we certainly would have done stem cell up front in that patient before. 94% two-year survival. Now, these are the selected patients who have less cardiac involvement. So, But the hematologists have really made progress with this disease. So now, as cardiologists, we need to realize that there is treatment. Back to that first slide I showed you of which ones have amyloid. They All of these patients have amyloid. They all happen to have AL amyloidosis. So how could that be? You're going to say those echoes. Now, this one over here looks pretty classic, but what's the issue with the other ones? Well, this first patient uh, had AL amyloidosis, and even though her echo was not at all classic, she had reduced ejection fraction without uh, uh, LV dilatation. But she had bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. She had new low voltage on her ECG. She had, uh, she had an a infarct pattern that was new on her ECG. She had hypotensive response exercise. So she had a lot of clinical features. We don't know what her wall thickness was before. Maybe they were even thinner than they were now. But she probably had a lot of light chain toxicity contributing to her uh, uh, presentation. She ended up having a heart transplant and doing well. This second one, this is Mayo format, so you've got left ventricle here on the left side. But you notice that it could look like non-compaction, or you might think, is it eosinophilic heart disease? I was really public, uh, um, puzzled about this patient until I happened to be talking to our cardiac pathologist one day, and he goes, oh, you know the reason that that one confused you? That was almost all endocardial amyloid. So classic amyloid by imaging is pretty easy, but there are these variations. And in his case, he had mostly endocardial, not that much myocardial infiltration. And that's why uh, his echo was abnormal. His MRI uh, was also uh, had an unusual pattern. Um, and in this patient, we actually knew that he had a GI biopsy positive. So he um, ended up having heart biopsy proving AL amyloid and had a stem cell. And this lady had uh, unexplained heart failure. She had, you know, a report on her echo of LVH, and she's only 38 years old without any hypertension. So she's a pretty classic one. This lady, I don't have it in this presentation, but she had a stem cell transplant 
and this is kind of in the early days, probably she wouldn't get one now, but she did get one and she got through that okay. And she's had complete normalization of her echo and she is alive almost 20 years later. So uh, one of the key things that I think cardiologists need to think about is it's not as simple as we've been saying. So it's not just a simple infiltrative cardiomyopathy. It really is additional toxicity from the circulating light chains in AL, and there are probably similar mechanisms in the uh, TTR patients. So Dr. Falk actually has called this a uh, toxic infiltrative cardiomyopathy, and that's the way I like to think about it. So it's not just the infiltration, but it's the light chains themselves uh, being toxic to the myocardium. So um, when you start seeing more of these, you'll realize that there are a lot of variations. Uh, the classic ones are pretty easy for us to diagnose by imaging, but these other subtle ones uh, are not. So we need to be uh, alert for that, and that is part of our uh, uh, challenge. And just to illustrate that, a really key thing uh, is that cardiac amyloid is not all about wall thickness. So on our echo report, there happens to be a statement that says, findings consistent with advanced cardiac amyloid. And Buzz Miller, who, one of my heroes, loves to use that. And I'm like, don't put that on there. That The echo is not telling you everything about the amyloid in the patient. And here's the reason. That lady that I just showed you, she was really sick. Another clue to amyloid for her was that she did not tolerate beta blocker ACE inhibitor that she got for her low EF. And so she has just normal looking wall thickness and she ended up getting a heart transplant six months later. Here's one of our wild type patient. He has some of the thickest walls you'll ever see and you'll see that he's walking three miles a day. So it's not all about the wall thickness. It's more complex than that. Another thing before we kind of go into a, a few more cases in our algorithm too is um, uh, an important thing to uh, recognize is that these patients have an increased frequency not only of atrial fibrillation but of having uh, uh, intracardiac thrombus. And the uh, original pathology uh, uh, study that, that we looked at, here's a patient who was actually in sinus rhythm uh, who obviously died with this huge left atrial appendage thrombus. So patients can present sometimes with a stroke. They can have atrial thrombi even in sinus rhythm due to very poor atrial mechanical uh, uh, contractility and probably local factors of the uh, atrial uh, infiltration. So we looked at our uh, patients of, who had amyloid of either type who were undergoing cardioversion recently, and we found that 28% uh, of them were being canceled uh, due to intracardiac thrombus, and the majority of those were on therapeutic anticoagulation. We had 14% of our patients with amyloid that we cardioverted that had uh, complications, including VTVF, bradycardia requiring pacemaker stroke, kind of serious things, whereas our control group only had 7% cancels and 2% complications. Um, so we do do cardioversion in patients with amyloidosis, but um, I think this study supports what our practice has been is that for an elective cardioversion, we always do a TEE first, as long as, you know, again, emergency cardioversion would be a different situation, but um, even if they have been on therapeutic uh, anticoagulation. Most of these thrombi, by the, by the way, once they have them, they usually don't go away. And I think it's more related to amyloidosis rather than some failure of the anticoagulant or some unusual other manifestation. So the next patient I'll show you um, presented at age 66, dyspnea on exertion uh, that he had had for about a year. Um, he did have bilateral carpal tunnel uh, surgery 10 years ago, no history of hypertension. He went to see a primary care provider who said, and the patient actually said, I think I might just be depressed. But he got an echo, and the echo suggested amyloidosis. And actually, uh, I have this a little bit backwards. He got the BNP first, and he noticed, well, you shouldn't have a BNP of, you know, uh, 1,100. So that's what led to the echo. The echo suggested amyloidosis. The EF was 40%. He felt much better after uh, diuresis. So I know that you're all going to, going to order serum-free light chains now, right, as your next step, and serum and urine immunofixation, which he got, and those were all normal. Uh, and he had a negative fat aspirate. So now what's our next step going to be? So I think I heard some people say, are we going to biopsy him? Or are we going to do a PYP, MRI? What are we going to do? So most of us in this situation now, if we have this, uh, I know you have it available, but some centers don't, but uh, would do a PYP scan. 
uh, as a next step because the screening for the AL amyloidosis is uh, negative. And this is another one you can just, you know, think through this to yourself, is when can we use the PYP scan to make the diagnosis of TTR amyloidosis uh, in patients who have an echo or MRI suggestive of uh, uh, amyloid? So, you know, is it A, in the absence of monoclonal protein we can do that, or is it true that PYP may, uh, never has uptake in AL amyloid? or you always need tissue. I told you at AL you did. I've never heard of this test. So the answer, as you can see, is A, that if there is no monoclonal protein, and that's a key thing as we see PYP being more widely used, you have to make sure that you've excluded uh, AL amyloidosis. So we've already kind of had an intro, uh, and that patient did indeed have TTR amyloid. Uh, what's a PYP scan, and, and what should I, uh, uh, when should I use it? So. Back to the patients with the um, wild-type TTR amyloid, um, they have been 90% men in the series reported uh, to date, but we are increasingly recognizing that women get this disease. I already told you some of the clues that they have. Um, they often have atrial fibrillation, conduction system disease, and eventually they get uh, heart failure. The, True prevalence really isn't known. There are a lot of studies being done to try to determine that. But we are uh, seeing that it's certainly uh, 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 more common than we thought. And this is really changing rapidly. So I think we all need to kind of have an open mind about this, because as we see more, we're going to learn a lot more about this condition. And where are some of the places where you can find wild-type TTR just hiding in plain sight? Well, the older uh, autopsy uh, studies had shown that once people are above uh, 85, 25, or even uh, if you're above 90, 50% of people may have amyloid in the heart. Now, those, we don't all know the type, and some of those are atrial amyloid. Some patients may never get disease. They may just have incidental infiltration. But a really key study from our colleague Maz Hanna at Cleveland Clinic showed that if they looked at prospectively men more than 50, Women more than 60 who were having bilateral carpal tunnel release, they had the surgeon then send some tissue uh, and stain it for amyloid. They found 10% of those patients had amyloid. Five of them were wild type. They had a couple hereditary, and they, uh, uh, they had two ALs, including one patient who had AL with heart failure, but it had not been recognized yet. So now there might be some people where it's just isolated to the carpal tunnel. We don't know that, but this is an important opportunity to recognize. Uh, and now a lot of us are giving a kind of guidelines to our hand surgeons. The other thing I mentioned is we need to get the, the spine surgeons involved. But how about uh, HFPEP? So this is a classic study from Spain where they uh, also prospectively looked at patients who were over 60 who presented with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction who had a septal thickness of more than 12. And they did DPD, which is the type of scintigraphy they have uh, in Europe. And they found 13% of them were positive. Uh, they went ahead and did DNA. None of them had mutations. And interestingly, half of these were women. So that's also, there are studies that we're doing and others are doing to try to uh, see if we really find uh, that same uh, shockingly high number. In severe AS, uh, positive PYP has been reported in about 5%. And in the TAVR population, 15% of patients, this is Adam Castano, who now works at Pfizer, um, did this study, 15% of patients uh, had a PYP scan and overall findings consistent with TTR uh, amyloid. So it's really out there. We're, we, we really are seeing it every day. Why do we miss it? Because here, here's a patient with wild-type TTR amyloid. So his uh, chief complaint actually was, my peak VO2 is declining. I mean, this is honestly what he came in and said. Now, I, I never ever had a patient that said that before. Uh, he was a lifelong competitive bicyclist, and he was a trainer. So he had all the VO2 equipment, and he did everything else too. EPO, blood training. I mean, he had done all kinds of things that were related to his training, but he was focused on his peak VO2. And um, he had a series of diagnoses. First, he was told that he had athlete's heart. Then he was told that uh, he had exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension. Then he was told that he had non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Saw a world expert in that. And then the next time he came back, because this happened longer ago, he had an MRI uh, right after the classic MRI paper had been reported. And then they said, oh, now you have amyloidosis. So, and I didn't include it, but his VO2 did 
it slowly declined and then it just dropped. I mean, just fell off a cliff. And that's what these patients tend to do. They tend to be stable for quite a period of time and then over a period of months or so, they, they decompensate. But when he walks in your office, historically, you're not going to think that he has wild type TTR amyloid. But actually, he looks like a lot of the patients that I see now. So we all really need to know about it. And eventually, I think we're going to need to have a network of local, regional, and national uh, 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 experts. So the PYP is an interesting story because this is a bone scanning agent. And, and it was noted years ago, this is a report uh, from our institution that that uh, patients who had amyloid, the, the PYP was lighting up in their heart when they were going for bone scans uh, for other reasons, but it was thought to not be very helpful because it wasn't lighting up in everyone with amyloid. That's before we even really knew that much about the different types of amyloidosis. So this is really a, a rebirth of, uh, a, of an old idea, and that led to an international consensus uh, uh, panel uh, to look at the data, um, which was over 1,200 patients of, uh, who had had nuclear scintigraphy of one uh, type or another. Sensitivity is reported to be 99%, specificity about 86% for cardiac ATTR, recognizing, though, that these were mostly patients with a high pretest probability. So we have to keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, but really, the crucial thing is to know is that AL patients can have uptake with PYP. Uh, and there's a little confusion in the literature, but it can even be grade two or three uptake. So that is why you have to be so careful about excluding AL amyloidosis. So I really do think it's a great test. And at a center like this, you have endomyocardial biopsy readily available, safely done, but this is not the case in all of our practices, you know, throughout the United States. So um, we can't just biopsy everyone, I don't think, even though I think Arvind maybe thinks that we should. But um, so in the absence of a monoclonal protein, then you can use nuclear scintigraphy. And here's an example of this would be a negative uh, PYP and this would be uh, a positive one. Um, so it really can replace uh, endomyocardial biopsy in the right clinical setting. But remember that that paper said that you had to have heart failure with typical echo or MRI findings, not just any patient walking into your clinic that you happen to just send, and then you had to have no monoclonal protein. So it's been a revival of nuclear cardiology, but we definitely need to uh, do it right and make sure that you rule out AL. Another thing, we think it's really quite important to do SPECT imaging because that way you can make sure that the uptake is really in the myocardium, that it's not blood pool uh, uh, uptake. And for those of you who haven't seen it, this is what it'll look like on SPECT, showing you this diffuse, definite myocardial uh, uh, uptake. Um, so the limitations of it is that for wild-type TTR, which really is the most common type of cardiac amyloid, 30 to 40 percent of those patients are going to have monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. So you're not going to be able to use the PYP alone. I still often use it, and if the PYP is positive and then fat aspirate is negative, bone marrow is negative, depending on the opinion of the hematologist, we may not always do a cardiac biopsy, but you have to work them up more for uh, uh, AL amyloid. So uh, Dan Judge helped me with this. For Mugus, you, you uh, have to get tissue then before you can make a diagnosis of TTR amyloid. And he came up with this Mugus is must go under the skin and get tissue from somewhere. Um, so back to that patient that I told you about, 66-year-old with uh, uh, amyloid EF of 40. Uh, there's his biomarkers, um, and he did have a positive PYP scan. Uh, and had a, a, a negative DNA TT uh, sequence, so he had wild-type TTR. And so just think to yourself, so what's the prognosis when he's first uh, um, presenting? And um, interestingly, if you look at it, uh, we and others have very consistent data that the median survival has been about three and a half years from the time of diagnosis of patients with wild-type TTR, recognizing that these historical cohorts, however, were probably more advanced. We're starting to see you know, patients earlier in their disease. And we did develop a biomarker staging system. That patient would have been uh, uh, stage two, which would be right at about the three year. So you, we can use biomarkers to risk stratify the ones that really have a poor prognosis versus those that might live longer. So what happened to him, though, two and a half years after his diagnosis, actually he was having worsening symptoms, a lot of, a lot of fatigue. He again worried that he might be depressed. He had... Uh, hypotension, 
his echo showed his strain was worse, his cardiac index was really low, his RV was bad. I'm like, I don't think this is depression. And really what happened is he had progressive heart failure that was primarily low output uh, and symptoms of uh, uh, syncope. He was really class four. His cardiac index uh, was about 1.3. Uh, and when I looked back, his troponin was very high in the beginning. That was, that was a key. And he did fit in so that our prognostic model would have about a three-year survival. So I thought, well, this is not so crazy. But even, uh, uh, you know, so this only happened. He was diagnosed just about three years ago. Um, he was kind of told, he, even in our practice, uh, I'll blame it on the hematologist, said, oh, you know, this is a slowly progressive thing. So he kind of got this idea in his head that it was no big deal. So when I met him first, that was really difficult. But we tried everything, and he was not improving. So he ended up uh, uh, getting uh, a heart transplant, and he's actually doing doing very well this time. So these patients, you're going to start seeing a lot more of them if when we diagnose them earlier that are going to be heart transplant uh, candidates. So I wanted to just show you the algorithm that we use, recognizing that all of these algorithms have challenges. You always have to have a clinician, you know, thinking about this to put this together. But when we have a suspicion of cardiac amyloid, I think the best thing is to do the screening test for AL amyloidosis up front. They are easy. They're inexpensive. I'll have people say, oh, I can't remember what they are. Well, just put them on your electronic record, and it's not that hard. Then they'll want to skip the urine. And I'll say, well, are we really going to skip the urine when some of these patients have two or three casts, they have an echo, they have an MRI, you know, and we're not going to have them pee in a cup? I mean, just do the urine <laughs> immunofixation. And then if you do that, you can, if, if it's positive, you've got to go down this, this route. And it'll depend, you know, here you're probably going to have uh, more available than, again, at other centers. But we usually will do a fat aspirate because we have that readily available and a bone marrow. If you have amyloid and you have typical imaging findings, you don't even need a heart biopsy. You know it's AL. You start chemotherapy. You're ready to go. Always make sure you do the typing. If you go down this pathway and you haven't gotten a diagnosis, you're still suspicious, you really should do a cardiac biopsy. Um, you could go back over here and do a PYP, but you still have some monoclonal protein, so you're going to be uncertain. Um, now, if it's completely negative, you can go down this other pathway. You can get your PYP. If it's positive, then all you're going to need is a TTR sequence, which you really should get in everyone, and you can figure out if you have wild type or um, hereditary amyloid. So I, I, I think that hopefully, I think it's a pretty practical way to approach it. What, what about treatment? So a lot of you have heard that um, and I didn't focus on the AL treatment because that's going to be treating the underlying disease with chemo, uh, chemotherapy and or stem cell. But for cardiologists, what we're going to end up needing to know more about is how do we treat TTR amyloid. So you can think of it that there's really three ways that, that have been proposed so far. You can stop production. Uh, of transthyretin from the liver. For, for hereditary patients, that's actually been done with a liver transplant. Now there are medications that can, that can do that, the RNA silencer uh, medications. Um, and these uh, have recently been approved. You can stabilize the protein with tefamidus uh, or diflunosol uh, or another agent, AG10, which is uh, entering into clinical trials now or entering into phase three study. Or you can try to disrupt the amyloid that's already deposited in the heart. And there's been some evidence about doxycycline and Tudka doing that. Tudka is Toro, so deoxycholic acid. Doxycycline, by the way, though, seems to be a more nonspecific inhibitor of amyloid formation. So there is evidence that it may be helpful in AL amyloidosis patients as well. And there is a monoclonal antibody um, for TTR amyloid that is in the phase one uh, uh, clinical trial. So there really is a lot, lot going on. Uh, and you may recognize that these medications, the RNA interfering uh, agents, got approved last uh, summer. Tefamidus so just got approved uh, two weeks ago, uh, earlier than uh, expected. And eventually, liver transplant is probably not going to be done too much in the future with the medications, although you could argue depending on the price. Um, so looking at the uh, two silencers, or RNA interfering drugs, uh, Petisteran and Enotericin, they um, uh, both work in similar uh, uh, fashion, and they were studied in neuropathy trials. So key thing to re rec uh, recognize is that those were hereditary patients only with neuropathy. 
Now, they could have uh, heart failure, but they um, could not have uh, uh, class three or four heart failure. So we don't really have cardiac endpoints. We have neurologic endpoints. And they both did slow the progression of neuropathy and improved quality of life. And it's pretty impressive to see some of these patients stabilize, or even over time, they may improve. And certainly, we've anecdotally, or we have seen patients on these trials where their heart seems to stabilize, too. But we don't really have the... Uh, 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 cardiac trials, which those are now uh, coming. So we have cardiac trials coming in these. These are very, very expensive medications, uh, $450,000 a year um, with some programs for coverage. So we could have a whole <laughs> another session on that, but uh, uh, just to recognize that part of it. So what about um, tafamidus? So the, the ATTRACT study was a study of uh, patients with both wild type and hereditary TTR with cardiac involvement. So now it's a cardiac uh, trial, and tafamidus is a stabilizer of TTR. Diflunosol is also a stabilizer that's been shown in neuropathy to slow progression, but diflunosol has the problem of the nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory um, uh, side effects, which many of our patients can't tolerate. So that's actually why, why tafamidus was developed. It's not clear that tafamidus is any better at stabilization, but it doesn't have the side effects. So this is a New England Journal uh, uh, trial of tafamidus, uh, 441 patients. Uh, it strongly hit the combined endpoint, which was uh, CV death, or I'm sorry, overall mortality and um, heart failure hospitalizations. And then just showing you that there was a 30% reduction in, in all-cause mortality. So pretty strongly positive study, and the number to treat was uh, 7.5. So this just got approved at $225,000 a year, and we're going to find out what the cost to patient is. I, we've had one patient quoted 18000 a year, and I just heard another one yesterday is only going to pay $120 a year. So it's, this is a wide, widespread. Uh, um, so I'm going to just, uh, in the remaining time, go through a couple of cases that uh, uh, maybe will uh, pique your interest. So this, uh, this patient is a 65-year-old who's a, a cardiac anesthesiologist, lifelong athlete, and he's known that he's had a monoclonal gammopathy for over 20 years. He had carpal tunnel release 12 years ago. Now he's got symptoms on the left. He had a prostatectomy about four years ago. He's had atrial flutter for a couple years. He had had a, a ablation. His blood pressure has been high, especially when he's in the operating room. Uh, but when he's otherwise relaxing, it's okay. I'm like, well, but you're in the OR a lot of the time. But so it, he's been known to have thickened walls for about four years. But he got into big time trouble when he was backcountry skiing. He was at high elevation. He basically went into pulmonary edema. He recognized he had to be taken down off the mountain. And he had been at high elevation many times before. Not that that precludes you, but he, he recognized it. And then even when he got back down, he recognized that he had uh, heart failure. So he had an echo that uh, was kind of inconclusive, um, uh, suggested maybe amyloid, the MRI, uh, hard to know. The bone marrow showed 5% plasma cells, no amyloid, and that was actually reviewed at Mayo. So your next step, well, in his case, he got better with Lasix. He was actually playing singles tennis. He came to Mayo for an evaluation of amyloidosis. And honestly, he other although he has a mugus, everything else about him fits the picture of TTR amyloid, including, he said, you know, in retrospect, my exercise tolerance has been going down for about four years, I think. Um, we did the fat pad, and it was positive for amyloid. So I'm really uh, uh, thinking that he's going to have TTR, even though fat pad is only positive about 15% of the time. And here's his, his light chain. So his lambda was 18.7, but he said it's been that way, you know, for a while. And the bone marrow, remember, showed no uh, amyloid. Um, so his BNP wasn't too high, 895. His echo was pretty classic uh, uh, for amyloid. So we did a PYP at grade three uptake. So I am thinking for sure he has TTR amyloid, most likely wild type. And um, that was his PYP scan. So... You know, you could say, but he's got a monoclonal uh, uh, gammopathy. So we said we really have to know what he has. So we biopsied his, uh, oh, the mass spec comes back on his fat, and it's AL amyloidosis. Now the patient is, like, getting ready to fly on some international trip, but I had to call him and tell him, you know, that was AL in your fat. I was not expecting that. And when we did his heart biopsy, he has very significant amyloid, severe interstitial, moderate endocardial, mild vascular, 
and the mass spectrum is hard choice. He's got AL and TTR amyloid. So he has two types of amyloid. Now, I don't want to totally freak you out. <laughs> That's only, this is only, uh, you know, this is less than 1% of our cases of mass spectrometry, but we've seen there are a few people that have more than one. However, as best they could tell, you know, AL seemed to be more predominant. But I think that's why his PYP was lighting up. He's got two types of amyloid. Oh, my gosh. So we decided we got to treat the most life-threatening one first, the AL amyloid. But he pushed me to go back. And so what do you think he wanted me to do? He wanted me to go back to the prostate biopsy four years before. In retrospect, that's when he first got dyspnea. The prostate showed AL amyloidosis. So most of the time, pathologists are not looking at prostate tissue, but I have found out that's a pretty good source of finding TTR or AL. So anyway, four years ago, he had AL. So the reason I, uh, you know, in his case, what we did is he actually had a stem cell. We deferred the treatment. Now we have him, uh, uh, now he ended up getting to famitis, so he's getting treated for both. So the thing is, is that if you have a monoclonal protein, the PYP alone cannot be used. He had grade three uptake, in his case, because he also had TTR. Make sure you get the tissue, follow the algorithm. But some of these AL patients have a more slowly progressive course. We used to say that a patient like that couldn't have amyloid. We would teach a fellow, oh, he's had dysmere for four years. That couldn't be AL amyloid because he would not have survived. Well, that's not true. Um, so there, the, he's one of these variations. And there are really rare patients that may have one, more than one type. And that's where we're all uh, uh, learning things. This one, I'll just show you quickly that here's a patient with uh, 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 diagnosis of myeloma, carpal tunnel, uh, uh, that uh, syndrome six to eight years ago. And he's another one where um, from the prostate, they found amyloid. And then they went and sent him to a hematologist. That's when he actually got diagnosed with myeloma, 15% plasma cells. I'm learning that not all myeloma needs to be treated, even though it seems to me like, oh, wouldn't you have to treat that? No, not necessarily. And what happened with him is he was diagnosed with myeloma, but given Cyborg D um, primarily because they thought that he had cardiac amyloidosis. Um, and actually what happened to him, he got very sick, he got a lung infection, he had all kinds of complications. And the bottom line with him is... <laughs> turns out that he actually had TTR amyloid at his heart. So these myeloma patients do not necessarily get AL amyloidosis if they get amyloid. So they're older people with myeloma. Not all myeloma is amyloid. If they get amyloid, you really have to biopsy the heart to figure out what type. Because patients with uh, TTR amyloid do not do very well if you give them chemotherapy. It's not a good thing. Um, and uh, uh, he got much, much better when we got him off of chemotherapy. A couple more cases that I'll show you is this is a gentleman who came to the Mayo Clinic for floaters. Uh, he had had a vitrectomy about five years ago. He did have peripheral neuropathy that um, he wasn't really seeking too much evaluation for, but the Mayo ophthalmologist looked in his eye and said, I think you have amyloid. So he did the vitrectomy, and they can, they can look for amyloid there, and he had amyloid, and the mass spectrometry showed that he had the V50M mutation which, by the way, they changed the sequence. So historically, you'll read that as v, uh, V30M, which is the most common mutation reported worldwide. But the official DNA nomenclature now is V50M. So the same as when I said V122I, it'll get reported as V142I, and we'll confuse you a little bit. But anyway, he had the V30M mutation, and when you look back at his history, his father probably had the same thing and died of heart failure. Um, his fat aspirate was negative. He does have a definite peripheral neuropathy. His echo was, um, was abnormal, even though he didn't have much many symptoms. And he actually had grade 1 or 4 diastolic dysfunction, which we don't usually see in amyloid. But his, his walls were thick. His strain was okay. But when we did uh, his biomarkers, those were abnormal. Um, EKG, uh, uh, you know, wasn't, you know, we're never definitive, but he didn't have an infarct pattern, and he did have some poor R-wave progression. So our next step with him is that we did a PYP scan, and there he is. So he, PYP is more sensitive than echo, it seems. So this patient has cardiac and neurologic involvement, and he just came for floaters with his eyes. So these, these even these hereditary patients are not so rare, and here's the uh, SPECT imaging on him. So the last uh, patient that I, uh, that I want to show you um, was diagnosed about a year ago with AL amyloidosis. She presented with heart failure. She had only had symptoms probably for about four months. Her troponin was 0.32, NT-probium P a little less than 1,800. 
She had had intermittent atrial tachycardia. In fact, her heart rate around the time of diagnosis was always around 100. Um, her EF on the outside was reported at 35% with moderate to severe TR, but she did get um, diuresed and she got put on a little um, beta blocker that slowed her heart rate down a little bit. Our echo reported a higher EF, but findings consistent with amyloid. Her TR wasn't as bad, but she had definitely abnormal strain and her cardiac index on, by echo was about two and a half. She was in the criteria where she met criteria for stem cell. She didn't have any extra cardiac involvement. So she had a stem cell transplant. And again, we had had this atrial tachycardia and then some sinus tachycardia. She had AFib with RVR after the stem cell, but she slowed down with a little bit of beta blocker and she would go in and out of it. And she, she did really quite well around the time of her stem cell, which is a little gutsy considering that one EF had been reported at 35%. But the, the hematologist, this is all they care about. They don't care about what cardiologists say. So anyway, um, she actually probably was a good thing because she had a complete hematologic response. Um, or AFib, uh, but she went back into AFib, and she had been kind of in persistent AFib on anticoagulation. Her heart rate was about 100. Her biomarkers were stable. But early this year, she presented and had bilateral pulmonary embolus. She actually had a history of DVT in the past. Her heart failure was worse. Her EF was down. She had severe TR. Stroke volume index was really low, 17. Her NT-proBNP was 6,000. You see her catheter numbers are horrible, right? And she's still in AFib. Her average heart rate's about 100. So what to do? So actually, this is showing her her serial. I'm going to click ahead with that. Um, she ended up on milrinone. We started thinking that this is a lady that's had a hematologic response but no cardiac response. So she's probably going to need a heart transplant. She got VT from the milrinone but no other benefit, TE, no thrombus, amiodarone, uh, and cardioversion she ended up getting because she had no, no thrombus on the TE. And now... She comes back in April with these beautiful hemodynamics. Her echo is better. And I am so happy that I was wrong about this lady. So I really thought that she needed a heart transplant. So uh, just take the challenge. I think all cardiologists can find amyloid uh, as a level of evidence C. Here's one of our cardiologists, just the guy with a little bit of abnormal ECG. She puts down the handheld uh, echo. That was actually Sharon Mulvey who did this. And here she finds a guy walking around with wild type TTR. So I think we can, we can all find these patients. They're out there everywhere. Um, know the screening test. Make sure you do a cardioversion. Uh, and uh, the treatment options are rapidly expanding. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Grogan, for a really wonderful tour de force through amyloidosis. I know it's uh, hard with a mixed audience of people that know it well and, and some people that aren't as versed in it, but it was really just a wonderful, a wonderful lecture. I'm going to open up for questions while the people are percolating on their questions. I was going to ask you on the role of genetic testing, and particularly if you have someone with, with TTR um, suspicion, if they, if they have an echo or MRI that suggests amyloid, the negative free light chain ratio. Are you doing a PYP first before you're doing genetic testing or doing them simultaneously? We, we usually are doing the PYP first, I guess. But if I have a really strong suspicion, I just order the DNA. Yeah, it's not that expensive anymore. But. And if you have a negative uh, biopsy uh, that you know shows wild type but, but it does not show mutation, are you also getting yeah, genetic we, testing? Yeah, uh, even on that mass spec report, it recommends that you do a DNA sequence because there are some mutations that cannot be picked up by mass spectrometry. One of them is isoleucine 88 leucine, which is common in Italy. And, um, because there's not that much difference between the isoleucine and leucine. So uh, we do do the DNA. You can do it through those complementary programs, Al Nylum and others, or your genetics lab. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Zabdi. Martha, thank you for coming. Wonderful lecture. Um, basic question. In the past, used to be for amyloid, you get an echo, increased thickness or LV mass, and a low voltage on EKG. What happened to that? Is ah, it still question. valid? So great question. So the trick with, though, it is still very important when you're reading echoes or MRI to correlate with the ECG, because if you see low vo voltage that's low and the walls that are thick, you're really going to be suspicious. Uh, or if you see a pseudo infarct pattern, there's no regional wall motion advice. But the reason we cannot rely on the ECG is that only 25% of the wild type patients have low voltage. 
even for AL, it's only 45%. Mm. So it's a helpful clue when it's present, but it doesn't get you off the hook. That's great. But a great question, because many times that's a misconception. Uh, in our ECG paper for AL amyloid, we saw that 16% of them actually met criteria for LVH. So it's unusual, but you can even have criteria for LVH on, on the ECG. So from a clinical present, if you're thinking of a marker or at least clinical presentation before dyspnea and heart mm -hmm. failure, autonomic neuropathy, yes, right? Like orthostatic hypotension, autonomic neuropathy, bilateral corporal tunnel, right? And in, in an appropriate age group, if you will. Anything else that would point you in that direction, you know, yeah, before so somebody is... neuropathy, carpal tunnel, for the TTR patients, then we have spinal stenosis um, would be the other third one. And recognizing that in AL, of course, they can present with nephrotic syndrome. They may present with one of the, you know, they may present actually with macroglossia. They may have symptoms of that. So they may present with one of the extra cardio, but you, more commonly, it would be renal presentation. And then, it, like my patient, uh, the first one with just a little bit of palpitations, it may take a while before they get heart failure. But those would be the key ones. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that elegant uh, talk, Dr. Owen. And I will have to confess that I am, I, I will be a biopsier as you have claimed me to. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I have many questions, but I'm going to confine to a couple of them. You, know, you pointed out as we're learning, we're seeing more and more amyloid, kind of this serendipitous discoveries. What is the false positive rate of chondroid staining in the context? Should we make chondroid staining a standard for all tissues, just like H&E? Uh, will that yeah. yield early diagnosis, and will we run into false positive rates? Yeah, I think, so the uh, Congo red, what I've learned is a lot of, like a lot of things. Um, it sounds simple to those of us who have pathologists that are used to doing it, but it's not necessarily uh, well interpreted by those who don't, don't see a lot of them. So I, I think that it probably be going too far to start doing Congo red on, on every tissue. You know, that would be low yield. Similar to people have said when we're in these amyloid talks, why don't we just do free light chains on all patients with heart failure? We actually have been doing that in the heart failure clinic. We looked at the yield. I mean, it's just not justified. Now, if you have a higher NT pro BNP and a few other things, you can get to a su subset. But I, 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 I don't think we need to do Congo Red on everyone. I think, though, with the experienced pathologist, it's quite good, Congo Red. Yeah, uh, oh, false positives. One time, one situation is insulin. So patients said in, they can get these localized amyloidomas. It's not a false positive Congo red, it actually is amyloid, localized amyloid from their injections. So yeah, that's that's interesting because you know. we did have one who was sent here for amyloid in fat pad, just didn't add up, mm -hmm. and then the cardiac biopsy actually showed sarcoidosis. Ah, and yeah. It was completely and so it look back to see if that was a diabetic. Yeah. My my other question is: Is there a variation in prognosis, and maybe it's a hematology question when we see amyloid? with a combination of like a Valdenstrom, we had a case of Valdenstrom microglobulinemia with amyloid or IgA myeloma. Mm -hmm. Are there prognosis difference because we struggle in deciding for transplant outcomes? When yeah. it's pure amyloid, we're more comfortable. So I think both Waldenstrom's and myeloma, uh, um, most people would think that the overall outcome is not as good in those diseases. So that's the issue for cardiac transplant. Now we have a debate in our center the Waldenstrom, I think, is more rare, so I, I, I don't know that much about that. But uh, Dr. Maury Gertz and Dr. Angela Dispensieri have pretty opposite opinions on the ones who really meet the criteria for myeloma. And Angela says, if you look at their 10-year survival, uh, is it really justified to use a scarce organ of a heart transplant because what is their survival? Um, Maury says, well, treatment is getting better and better. So far, I would say probably most of the evidence is if you really have myeloma, you need, you need to be cautious. But uh, you make these decisions all the time, too. And, and uh, if they're responding to treatment, for us, one of the key things is are they responding to the treatment? This lady that I showed you at the end, I really thought she was going to need a heart transplant. So we looked at all of her biomarkers, prognostic things, and the hematologist said, her 10-year survival was 80% from AL amyloidosis. So that was good enough for us to consider. You know, her five-year survival was 90% based on all the, all the factors we had on her. So I think, I think the myeloma thing probably is still important. Um, thank you, Dr. Gokun, for that excellent talk. My question was more about strain. So if you have somebody who has an abnormal kappa-lambda ratio, but their echo completely looks normal, the strain is normal, 
how do you still biopsy those patients if the echocardiogram just does not look like amyloid and the strain is normal also? Oh, yeah. So, of course, you'll have a lot of patients that have, some of them just have isolated uh, elevation of, of, of uh, light chains that are related to renal insufficiency. But if the ratio is still abnormal and strain is normal, I wouldn't necessarily biopsy them. I do a fat pad, and if the hematologists think they need to bone marrow, I would. But if the echo looks normal and the strain looks normal, they don't have any elevated cardiac biomarkers, then I probably would not biopsy them. The other thing about strain is it's also great, and we've picked up these subtle patients where the walls aren't very thick. Uh, or some other reason we do, you know, you know we, we look at them. Uh, the strain, I think, helps us a lot, but it is not specific for amyloidosis. And, uh, you know, we've seen patients with, I didn't have time to show up, we have a plaquenil cardiotoxicity that has the apical sparing and a positive PYP. We have several positive PYPs in plaquenil. And then we've seen hypertensive heart disease pretty commonly. So, you know, you need to put it in context. Again, it's more helpful in the positive rather than, you know, I mean, I think we just need to be careful with it. Thank you, Dr. Grogan, for the talk. Um, my question is, so we've learned that amyloid is more prevalent than we actually know, and not all the patients have the classic features on the echo. So my question is, if a patient presents you with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, do you tend to typically screen all these patients for amyloid? Like, do you tend to, like, send light chains and, like, protein fixation to yeah, all these patients? Yeah, so... Um, we kind of, in a roundabout way, were doing light chains, but we did see that the yield was extremely low if you were just doing undifferentiated heart failure, which would include a dilated cardiomyopathy. Amyloid patients can get dilated LVs, and especially the TTR patients can get reduced EF. So the idea that it's always HEFPEF is definitely not correct. Even that lady I showed you that had the kind of normal wall thickness, her, her EF was reduced. We have not, well, we kind of have been doing it. Uh, we're going to take that probably off of our panel. When the BNP is especially out of proportion, we usually are looking for some other clinical features if you don't have anything on the echo that looks like amyloid. If you were really worried, you you could do an MRI to kind of, if you were worried about that, um, but not we have not routinely done it. Thank you again. I, I add everybody for thanking you for a great question. Um, for somebody like me who's been four decades in this business, it's great to see a disease that used to be 100% fatal to see the progress. My question is, in your therapy, you show some wonderful new drugs all of which are very expensive. How do you guys decide which one to use? In other words, there are several drugs that can be used for the wild type, several that, they're all expensive. Do you have now, are you developing your own algorithm to yeah, see, let so, me test, let me try this one on, on Joe and this other yeah. one on, on so Mary. Great, great question, and we do, we have, you know, we have sets of guidelines and I think you'll start to increasingly seeing those in the literature. The key thing to know right now is that those, RNA interfering drugs, that's enotericin, patisteran, on Patro and Tegsetti are the trade names. They are only approved for hereditary amyloid with neuropathy. So that's a small, small subsection. Once they get their other clinical trials, we hopefully will have some of these drugs for, uh, uh, for cardiac involvement. For um, uh, TTR cardiomyopathy, whether it's wild type or it's most commonly going to be wild type, uh, tefamidus just got approved and it's you know, um, going to be according to the cost for the patient. Diflunosol is a good TTR stabilizer, and it goes against everything that we teach in heart failure. But there are people, Matt Maurer and others have reported that more heart failure patients can tolerate diflunosol than we think. So we've used criteria that we don't have hard and fast, but if the patient is not on high dose diuretic, and occasionally we get patients that are not requiring any diuretic. So if they have not had frequent heart failure hospitalizations or a recent hospitalization, if they're not on high dose diuretic, if their creatinine is less than 1.8 or so, and we usually I am hesitant if the NT pro BNP is more than about 3,000, then we consider a trial of diflunosol. And a lot of these patients where the NT pro BNP is more like 1,500, 2,000, they tolerate it. And the other thing uh, that I'm realizing is, of course, originally they, they might get some more, they might need an increase in their diuretic. But I'm seeing some that I've had on it for a couple years now, and they're leveling out. So initially, you know, it's it not, not a big surprise that they got into some trouble with the diflunosol, but they were still able to take it. But as you go down the road, creatinine stabilizes and nt pro can come down. So it's a minority of patients, but if you find them earlier, 
you know, these patients that just had an incidental finding, ECG was a little abnormal, led to an echo, NT pro BMP is only 800. I, I really personally would try diflunosol first. With all the recognition that many of them are on antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation, I mean, all that stuff you have to take into account. But it is a specific stabilizer, and it's a fraction of the cost of tefamidin. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Rubin. Exit. <laughs> I didn't leave quite as much time as I was hoping. No, but, uh,